This is Kevin Pruitt with Rising Tide Startups, and my guest today is Haley Saddington. Haley, thanks for joining us on Rising Tide. My pleasure, Kevin. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you, and then I, I'm really anxious to kind of dig into your, your business background and what you're doing today, but tell, us, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Mm. Thanks, Kevin. So I really come from a non-technical background and I've learned my skills along the way over around nine years. So it's important to let people know it's been a journey and it hasn't happened overnight. I am the CEO and founder of a company called Halo Medical Devices. And that was all founded um, in my studies during my physiotherapy studies around nine years ago and it was all focused on helping people and that's the core of what we do so we design devices that are going to help people recover and that's as simple as we can get so i have along the journey along the way we've, we've won a swagger of awards we've got some incredible networks um, that we're able to open up to and fast track our, our progress or if we are doing another device, we're able to fast track um, what we're doing because we have the network and everything set up to go. But we're really around helping people. Our first device was put out into the market um, about five years ago. We sell in, in over um, 23 different countries at the moment. So very much a global focus. And the next device is going to be channeled into India. And that's around helping 40 million people wow. recover. Yeah, big, big numbers over there and, and big needs to really look after people post-surgery and, and get them some amazing technology that will support them physically and mentally at home. So you touched kind of on the business side of things. What about the personal side? I know you were you were a couple minutes late. You had sent me a note said I'm going to be a couple minutes late. What was the cause of the <laughs> delay? <laughs> so great, great to bring it up. So we, you know, this work life balance people talk about doesn't really exist. <laughs> so we've got a five week old baby in the mix, um, wow. a beautiful baby girl. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And so I think I've I've had my trainer wheels on having a startup, and uh, you know, no sleep with that at the very start, and and now I'm able to apply that to motherhood. So it's, um, that's a really recent thing for us and an amazing, amazing thing for our family. I mean, I, I, you, you beat me to the question. I was going to ask you, are, are there lessons that are interchangeable? I mean, can you, because I, you, people talk about birthing a Starbucks, a Starbucks, birthing a startup, you know, yes. <laughs> Freudian slip there. I must need a copy. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's okay. Um, some really great sort of translational lessons, if you like. I think um, one of the things I've learned most is now, now I'm back in the office and, uh, you know, actually an interesting um, sense. We, I've, our, our little girl's called Parker. Parker is four days old and I'm in um, pitching to investors and nothing really slows down. And what I've found is you have to be now really incredibly focused with your time. And that's something that a real a successful startup needs to do as well. So you've got a small, often a pocket of time, you've got to prioritize and get things done, particularly at the start in your startup, you've, you've got every hat, you're wearing every single hat and you need to be very focused on what you want to get done to progress. And that's the same as having a baby. So small pockets of time, um, we work, I go down the office, I work very, very hard and then I come back and I'm able to switch into family time and, and keep focused. Yeah. And when you get home, you just kick back and relax and just don't do anything. You just, I mean, motherhood <laughs> is just a, just a walk in the park and <laughs> oh, a walk in the park, except for the, uh, the no sleep, the, the diapers, the, uh, exactly. everything else that comes with it, as exactly. you well know. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I really appreciate you kind of touching on the personal side of that. I just think it makes a well, more well-rounded, you know, chat that we have and just really gives our listeners a little better picture of, you know, who it is on the other side of the camera here, but um, touch on the dad, let's go back to when you were, you know, doing your studies and you said you were, I mean, I'm assuming that it was in the medical field initially. So what was the transition and what was the, I guess, the trigger that, that, caused you to move from say medical mm -hmm. care to you know med tech or or whatever you have you want to phrase it yeah for me i i talk about my progression and and moving into business in a very eventful way and there's a quite a few key events that happened in my life that um pushed me and and i guess guided me into where i am today 
with that, it started at a much younger age. So why I want to help people is I experienced um, my dad having a farming accident at a very, very young age. And uh, I was the only person or, or kid on duty that day in the, in the paddock or the field. And um, dad had quite a severe um, injury. And so as a young age, I've had to drive him across um, back over the paddocks and then meet the, the, the plane to, to get him into surgery immediately and emergency care. So from a very young age, I was thinking, you know, what can we do, I guess, to be these people that we love who, who are recovering at home, what can we do to better their recovery? And I always had my dad in the back of my mind there. So the, the thoughts started very, very early and the next event really, I guess I went into physiotherapy where I was helping people, which is a natural progression, sure. also driven from my past there. And I had uh, two things happen. I, um, I got the life is too short bug and that happened because my, my, well, my sister-in-law at the time, she was actually crossing a road and she was hit by a car and mm. um, didn't, didn't make it. And so at, at a young age, I knew you know, life is very fragile. We need to make the most of it. And I've carried that through ever since, you know, anything I touch, I want to make sure I'm doing it really well. Yeah. And again, that sort of threw, threw me into the hospital system as well. Um, after that, in terms of career and where I wanted to go. So it's, it sounds like to me that, that you didn't necessarily choose the profession. I think maybe life circumstances almost chose it for you. I mean, you, you were almost just kind of, uh, I hate to use this. I think that it's a term we overuse sometimes, but this idea of mm. almost walking in destiny, you know, walking in, yeah. you know, whatever you were created to do. Mm. How important do you think that is for founders? I mean, you talk about, you know, you hear about, you've got to be passionate about your, your project or you've got to, you have to have this or this or this, but it sounds like to me that this is absolutely just who you are. Mm. It's at the core of, of what I do. And that is incredibly, uh, it's a critical point for founders. And I think, you know, not everyone has these things happen in life that sort of drills down and enables you to really know who you are at an early stage. Yeah. But there, there's obviously techniques that entrepreneurs can use and, and a simple one such as meditation enables you to really get in touch with the core of who you are and the core of what you should be doing. And if you're not doing that, particularly when you start out as an entrepreneur, you will end up listening to all these people around you because you are seeking a lot of information because you simply don't know all the answers yourself. And if you aren't filtering, uh, I, I guess, the advice that's coming in, you end up going off, off pathways. So that, that lesson of, of knowing who you are and understanding why you're doing what you're doing is is critical and we all know simon senate right so Absolutely. you know yeah. what's your why? why that's exactly right yeah. yeah so walk us through the kind of the founding of halo medical devices i mean so was it did you purchase one that was already existing did you start from scratch did you have partners in the in the formation of this walk us kind of through the your your founding story yeah and again i like to stress that it, what didn't happen overnight and i think that's something I didn't know at the start. At, at the very start, I was like, I'll give this two years, we'll make some millions and I'll, I'll, off I go kind of thing. <laughs> and that is far from the truth, as we all know. Um, you know, we, we look at sort of Facebook around sort of 10, 15 years to get to its, its heights and things as well. So at the very start, what, what we did is we had nothing. We had to create everything. And I say we, that's a habit. At the start, it was just myself. Yeah. So we looked at the current art or the device on the market that I really wanted to innovate and, and looking at, you know, was there a big enough need to actually innovate that? So part of my university or college jobs was actually um, in physio or physical therapy, therapy departments and, and OT departments. And so I got to speak to a lot of people around the device I wanted to, who I'd be selling it to and who would be actually using it. So we had some great, early validation and I would always encourage people to do that you've got to go to as many people as you can early on with your idea and, and get some feedback to make sure it's something that people are going to use people actually want and um, you know it's viable to to also create so we I, I started that at the very at the very beginning 
And from there, we, like over a five year period, I, I developed the product and we um, had mentors along the way as well. That would help me, uh, I guess, streamline into manufacturing and the entire research and development phase. I coupled that with partners. I coupled that with awards just by applying them for myself and getting some, some strong marketing and media attention to the company and brought on investors and, and off we went. So were you all in from the beginning or were you still kind of in the physiotherapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy space working? And this was kind of a side, kind of a side hustle as you got started or did you just kind of quit cold Turkey and start this? Great question. So we talk about our why and knowing what's right for you. I had been at university for 12 years. I hadn't finished or graduated anything. I'd just gone into the next degree and onto the next degree to sort of work my way into physio, which became my passion area. In my fourth year of physiotherapy, just before I was going to finish, I the, the, the Halo product started to develop and commercialize and get busy. So I left. I cold turkey left my prof profession that I was going to graduate in that I never worked in and left straight for um, the business world. And so, I mean, you had the device and I think I've, I've, I've done some like research online about the device itself. It's, it's almost like a, it measures like range of motion. Is that, is that a fair depiction of, of what, what the device actually, I mean, obviously I, I'm a layman, you know, non, non-professional. So that's how I would describe it. You could probably describe it much better than I could. Look, that's, that's a fantastic description. What we do is we look at how people are moving and um, we use this tool to objectively measure or, you know, a tool that has numbers on it. So instead of us guessing what the angle is on a, on a patient's limb or joint, we get to use this objective tool. And ours is within one degree of accuracy. And why we even invented Halo is because the other things on the market were up to 30 degrees out. And wow. I didn't think... Right, right. So that then throws the decision making ability. If you've got a tool that's telling you it can be up to 30 degrees difference, that's really giving the therapist who's using the tool on you mis misinformation and they may not know the efficacy of a treatment um, yep. and you go down a different pathway. So we really wanted to understand if people were getting truly better or truly worse. And that's why we made a really accurate device. So was this born a little out of frustration? I mean, even in, even in your, your education, I mean, you, you probably had clinical you know, labs and, and clinical assignments and things like that where you met with patients and, or, or were at least watching right. you know, physiotherapists work with patients. Could you see the, the difficulties of the, of the existing equipment and the, the deficiencies of that the equipment at that time? Absolutely. So there was, there was that part, I could see it and I could, you know, we were using it and being taught to use this device on, on patients. And, you know, even from the early days, my dad had this um, used on him as well back, back in the day. So I really saw it in use and, and understood exactly what was going on. But to couple that, you've got to get some serious backing behind your sure. thoughts. So you yeah. can't just think it's a, a problem. So I read a lot on the evidence on what we call this tool, it's called a goniometer. So I read a lot on goniometers and understanding the accuracy, what was wrong, what we could do better. And that was where we really started. I could see we could make a true difference just through changing the design. And that's, that's what led us through. So that, that's the existing product. Is that the only product that you have in the kind of the portfolio? And are there others, I mean, without any, without, you know, disclosing any IP here. <laughs> Are there other things on the on the drawing board that you're looking to? Yeah, look, I, I'm all about sharing. We have some great IP laid down behind us. That's something I do often, um, being an ideas person. So the next project we're developing is uh, much larger. So we're going much, much bigger. And what I mean by that is we're able to help and assist in the millions versus, you know, what we've done with our first product, Halo. This one is around, if you can imagine people going home after surgery, let's say you've had your, your knee done, mm -hmm. you're going home, you've forgotten what the surgeon said, you've got a hot flared up knee, you might walk too much, you might not feeling, 
feel like getting out of bed. So we wanted to really give people access to um, an artificial intelligence device that you wear that gives you this support and the knowledge of the physiotherapist, the surgeon and the nurse. And this is something we're building out now. We literally started eight weeks ago in this new development and it's all to do with creating a global healthcare equality system because we know 70% of people around the world cannot afford uh, their healthcare sure. and often they can't access it. So we're overcoming that through our technology. Now, I, I, would, I could continue to ask you questions about the devices and the planning, and, and, but, but that's, that's just what I want to hear about. But I also have listeners that I need to be a, kind of the representative for. And I, I normally don't do this, but I, I'm going to go a little free range here. I would love to just give you a little space to just talk about um, or just think back of, you know, the, the last few years of just, you know, trying to create a startup and being the founder of a startup. What are some, mm -hmm. some just highlights that you can remember or lessons that were, you, you know, that were really learned kind of the, the hard knock road, you know, that you had to go through to get there. Um, anything you wanted to touch on? I just kind of want to give you the space to, to kind of just like free range a little bit about that particular, about that space. Yeah, I'm sure. There's so many lessons that I've learned and um, and going forward, just the pure fact that we can make something in a year versus three or four years, which we've yeah. done in the past. And the, the lesson there is, you know, your networks are incredibly important mm. and um, making sure you set up right and, and knowing where, where you're going in the product and planning it out or the service or whatever you're, you're making. I think, getting very clear on, on what you're doing at the start is a really great lesson. Um, when you start out, you will, I mentioned it before, you're going to have a lot of people around you. You're asking for advice and people often offer quite different advice. Yep. And that can, as an, as an entrepreneur, right, you can go, it can be a fork in the road for you. So I think you need to be, you know, taking on board what you need, but being very clear on where you're going and why you're doing what you're doing in terms of, what you've got is it something that people want how you're going to position it in the market you know you have to do the work behind it and understand what the competitor space looks like you don't want to put out something in the market that um is exactly what you're doing uh you know already unless you're doing it a little bit better there's room for that right right but i think i think just moving moving forward in a very streamlined planned way so you can get things out to the market um, in a fast manner is important. Making sure you have correcting and great mentors on, on board is really yeah, important because absolutely. at the start, yeah, I think that I'm sure that's a common theme that people say on your, on your podcast. Um, and at the start, you can't afford consultants. You can't afford to, you know, bring in people and do everything you need. Um, unless of course you've gone and raised money or you've been able to put in a significant amount yourself. Um, but, but again, I guess that's a lesson as well. You want to maintain the equity in your company as long as you can, because at some point you're likely to have to draw down. So at the start, you um, obviously have a low valuation because you're just starting out. So you don't want to give everything away. So you need good mentors and you need to be able to access free advice and, and really understand um, how you can, I guess, use that free knowledge and do as much as you can at the start to to progress and get to a, a strong position where everything is, you know, much more de-risked. And, and what I mean right. by that is yeah. you, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad I gave you that space to kind of, kind of free range there for a second, because it, it really, it elicited two more questions that I wanted to ask you that, that can kind of came out yeah. of that space. But one of them is just about the device itself. So there's, there is a, you know, you think about a business startup, most business startups don't have the the huge amount of capital required for research and development. I mean, medical devices are heavily capital intensive to to create and refine and test, and you know, so that versus you know, I'm starting a digital marketing agency. I need a LinkedIn profile and a laptop, you know, or or something like that. I mean, it's it's almost mm -hmm. that stark difference. But so how do you how did you with 
you know, virtually bootstrapping early or, or very little capital early. How did you create this device or refine it or test it with, without a, this huge early infusion of capital? Mm. Yeah. So we, like, I really started um, with, with nothing. We had um, to build a prototype because you need to show people what you're, I guess you're getting that thought out of your head or the concept and that dream you want to start to bring it to life. So you need to build something. So whether that's a, a SaaS platform you want to build out or it's an actual product. So we've got a place over here. It's called Bunnings. It's a big hardware store and literally went down and we took some parts off the shelf and we built a, a little device, a little handheld device that conveyed it was essentially our first prototype. And uh, it cost about ten dollars, and we got to convey that, um, you know, that that vision more, much more clearly mm -hmm. just by building that out to potential stakeholders to then come in and be investors. And but to see what you've developed now, I mean, the the device that you created now is, I mean, it's it's twenty fourth century. I mean, it it looks really aesthetically. Um, I mean, it, it's almost futuristic. I mean to a, to a lay person's eye. I mean, it was really a beautiful product that you've created. So I, I want to give you kudos there because I, it's amazing where, where you've come from, you know, going down to the hardware store to, to get your prototype to what yeah. you arrived at today. Well, th thank you so much. And you know, you don't, no one has that cash to, to inject and, and spend on, you know, a group of engineers like Tesla do, yeah. or, you know, we, we just don't have that luxury. So we've got to think about creative ways to scale, scale slowly and, and build our vision and, and um, project slowly. And I think the other way is, you know, this incredible amount of grants available in, in Australia, mm. in Sydney um, yeah. that are, we've always been working with. And then you know, there's awards available. So you've got to be applying for these and you've got to be doing them as timely as they are. They bring free marketing, free media for you and um, often cash or in-kind support. And we heavily lent on that at the start in, in the first 12 to 24 months. Well, you were extremely successful because if you Google your name and it's amazing how many of those awards kind of pop up in a, in a list. I mean, it's, it it really is kind of crazy to to see just the the media attention that you've received you know early on. But I I wanted to ask you a question. Is as I'm I've tried to kind of imagine this as you've been talking about this this uh, this juxtaposition of creative and discipline together. You know how do you mm -hmm. how do you stay the course and stay true to your original vision and really but yet, I mean, you're obviously creative at the same time. So, you know, you would, you could struggle with shiny objects sy syndrome versus, you know, the whole idea of, you know, do you understand the question? I mean, how do you, how do you balance those two things? Yeah, I do. And look, there's at the start, I think it's particularly hard to do those things because you've got to have that creative mind. You've got to let it flare so you can be putting something uh, you know, really original and, and uh, with unique selling points out there to market. But you then have to have the discipline um, and the time and, and the knowledge to scale back and put the foundations behind mm, that creativity. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's building, you know, we talk about, you know, how are you going to convey this to investors or a grant person? You've got to have some stuff written down on a, right. on a business plan or, you know, some sort of PowerPoint decks. So you've got to be able to show them that you aren't just a creator and a dreamer because you are right, but you've also got the business foundation sorted. You know who your competitors are, you know, how much this is going to sell for, you know, the demand, you know, the people you're going to sell it to. And I think, you know, balancing that at the, at the start is incredibly hard. And as you get to build a team, you get to understand, you know, what you do best and then you go off and do that and, and you get to, you know, often founders are that creative type. So you get to just flourish in your creative world and bring the ideas in. And then you get to work with more, you know, the people who love numbers. And so you give them the numbers jobs and the accounts and the financials and then the creatives, you get the engineers to work um, out your, out your idea. So as you grow, it becomes much, much easier. But at the start, you do require a lot of discipline and I think extra time around, um, you know, piecing those out, you almost need to compartmentalize 
Right. And that is, yeah, good yeah creative hat on. Yeah. And couple it with the business end. So you, you said you kind of, you know, you talked in terms of we, when you started and we met you, not we met we. So what is, what is we grown <laughs> into today? Sorry, Kevin, that just completely dropped out. No, okay, sorry about that. Song. Yeah. So I, I, I said, you know, you talked in terms of we as a startup, but you said actually we was me. So what has we grown into? What has your team, how's your team grown over the, over the last few years? Yeah, so our team, we still work in a very similar way. So when we started, I hired consultants and I brought in who we needed when we needed them. And that really served us well because we didn't have a whole heap of overheads. You know, I didn't have to have the employee costs and, and the costs associated with bringing people in and holding them when you don't necessarily need them all the time. So I still use that model today and we consult um, out with a group of engineers. We have, so we have, Specifically, just on this new project we're working on, I have a group of um, seven engineers based here in Sydney, and they're they're our go-to engineers, our, our bring the dreams alive kind of guys. And then we manufacture over in Singapore, and we have another team over there, so development team consists of around probably around 25 people, so a mix of hardware and software engineers. They all sort of work in in one room, and they they bring the scalable and the manufacturing um, part to life. And then we have people in a, in, a, in a factory actually making it. And then we have a sales team um, globally. So no one still to this day um, is really sitting uh, as employees in the company. We, we hire out everyone we need. And, you know, maybe we, we work with them for two years and then the development's done. So we get to, you know, sort of move on to the next, next phase with another team. So that's the way we've worked. Right. Um, yeah, oh, that's a very efficient way to to build a team because it's almost like a, you know, the, the, the inventory, the just in time inventory, you know, system or whatever that you, when you need them, they're there. When you don't need them, you're not paying for downtime. So, I mean, I, I love the yeah. way that you kind of formed your team and it's, it actually is a, is a perfect segue into this, this kind of the last segment of our chat today that, um, I really wanted to drill down with you a little bit because I think that, you know, the things that you just talked about, about the, the, the combination of discipline and creativity, you know, I think has served you well. And, but we're facing a really mm -hmm. difficult time right now in the midst of the, you know, COVID-19, the, the coronavirus mm -hmm. pandemic. How have you kind of navigated that as a, as, as a business founder? And, you know, speak to our listeners a little bit. Uh, just give them mm -hmm. two or three just things that you think that, that you do that work, you know, that have helped you kind of navigate this, that you think it might be helpful to them as well? Yeah. So we learn, uh, sorry, we, when, let's just stop saying we. <laughs> so at the moment, <laughs> during the, this COVID time, it's, it's, it feels unprecedented. And um, I've heavily lent on my, my Harvard buddy network who um, I've developed in my World Economic Forum as a, as a young global leader. You know, I'm connecting with everyone around the globe regularly as, as friends in these, these networks to see how they're going, to see what they're doing as well, to really lean on each other during this time. They're all, uh, most of them are on entrepreneurs or, you know, high up in businesses. So it's very interesting to see what they're all all doing as well. So what I've taken from that and what we're doing in our company at the moment is really, in a sense, it's a bit of a Warren Buffett style. So we're buff we're buffering down, if you like, and and really building for the winter. So we're building up our our customer database. Um, we are making sure our sales are ready to roll as soon as people are ready to buy again. And so we're we're literally manually going back and we're rebuilding and, and um, scaling our databases and getting in contact with people and letting them know that we're here and when you're ready, we're ready. And um, we our main customers are our distributors selling to the many, many physical therapists around the world. We are making sure their needs are met. Um, you know, we have we have Italy, we have China, we have India, we have the US as some of our major markets, and they're all not buying. Right. Um, fair, fair, fair enough, right? They've got COVID matters to worry about, and and very real, um, very real problems mm. themselves. So we've really got in touch with them and made sure that 
yeah, they, they know we're here, whatever we can do to support, um, we're here to do that. And whenever you're ready, you know, we're, we're ready to go, let's touch base then. So that's one part of the business we um, have just thrown a lot of support and understanding to in a very humanized way. And then to progress and scale, um, what we're doing is working here with a, a team in Sydney. So very, very, you know, insular Australian R&D phase for us. We're making our next product. So we're able to keep building with no interruptions because we're not working outside of Australia at the moment yeah. and develop, develop our next product. So that's a couple of things we're, we're doing to survive and I guess thrive in, in this COVID time, which is hugely uncertain. We all have uncertainties at the moment. I mean, I love the way that you, you kind of talked about this. I mean, almost as a seasonal, you know, in seasonal vernacular, seasonal language, you said this is almost like our winter that we're, we're kind of, you know, hunkering down and preparing for our spring that we know is coming. We know where, or at least we anticipate that that will come when people will start buying again. And then kind of the, the economy will kind of kickstart itself again into, into activity. But I mean, I love that. And so are there, are there a couple of specific things that you are doing? Like, you know, you talked about, you know, really kind of drilling down and really getting your processes in place and, and you have the space to kind of work on this new product, but are there things internally in your business that are really specifics? Are you cleaning up databases? Are you touching base with ex existing and former clients just to say, Hey, we understand that, you know, are you, are you doing special out, you know, reaching out to them or anything, anything unique? Yeah, look, very much. We're, we're doing exactly what you've just said. Then we are reaching out to every one of our customers um, to just, just let them know where it's at to understand what their problems are in this current environment. Um, so we're specifically doing that and we're literally just emailing them. Uh, we are jumping, we're jumping on calls, uh, zoom calls, um, mm -hmm. We should have bought shares in Zoom, right? Which Absolutely. Is only knowing this was going to happen. So, um, you know, we're really, really making sure that we're connecting to everyone in this time. I think any business, no matter how big or how small they are, um, should be doing that. And that is going to enable you to, you know, when COVID lifts and when we're able to move a little bit more, you're going to be ready to go. But in a stronger position than perhaps pre-COVID. And um, the other thing I guess we are doing is, is really building up our, you know, social media following. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So really practically just building out that and we've, we've got a team, team working on that. Um, I think they're the main things we're doing. It's just all around connection and making right. sure we're, we're ready to go and our customers are, are okay. Yep. Well, Haley, I, I really appreciate you taking the time today and just kind of chatting with our, our listeners here and, and just really kind of walking through your startup story. I, I certainly want to congratulate you on the, the birth of the new little one um, and the birth of <laughs> Halo Medical Devices as well. I mean, just the, the successful, you know, creation of a startup and, and just seeing the, the accolades that came with that and the, the revenue that's come with that as well. And, and the way that you've kind of prepared to kind of weather this storm and and you know, lead lead your company into the the recovery phase at, when we can get through this. But is there any anything that I haven't asked you about that you just want to wrap up with real quick and uh, just just a final nugget of wisdom that I haven't touched on yet? Yeah, look, I, I think one of the most important things for us and uh, me per, per, professionally and personally as well is just surround yourself with those those people that are going to progress you and and. Um, you, know, you can bounce your idea off and I think that that rule of you know you the people you surround yourself that top five the, yeah. the five you sort of are around a lot really are you and if someone is not working uh, for you or you know towards what you want to be doing um, you, you've got to really look at that and I think um, in terms of you know you've got internal beliefs and external beliefs and, and people are sort of you know, you want people strengthening those and you want to be strengthening those yourself. So internally, you want to be doing meditation and getting on top of where you're going and, and how and, you know, being very true to your pathway. So making sure you're doing practices like that is extremely important. And and then really examining who's around you. You know, are they are they people supporting you on the way? Are they, you know, telling the truth about what you're doing and, um, you know, motivating you as well. So I, right. I think that's, 
you know, some of the five people around you is, is a good one to touch the base on. But Kevin, I just wanted to say as well, thank you so much for having a podcast such as this. It's um, incredible to support entrepreneurs and startups. There wasn't enough of that around when I started, which is which is why I love jumping online and having these conversations and, um, you know, really spreading on the word on how we do it and, and accessing these these type of resources. So thank you so much for putting this together. Well, I, I, I could not end this podcast any better than you just did because you've just displayed the, the whole ethos and culture around rising tide. And Haley, I just, I just want to thank you again for taking the time today and just really helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Have a great day. Thanks, Kevin. Same to you.